we got our next breakthrough thinker is uh, Vivek Wadwa. He is an entrepreneur, he's a researcher, and he is involved with three different universities, Stanford, Duke, and Singularity. He's very well quoted for globalization strategy and diversity. He's, one of the, he's named by the Foreign Policy Magazine as one of the top 100 global thinkers, and by the Time Magazine as one of the top 40 influential minds in tech. Please extend a warm welcome to Vivek Wadwa. Thank you. How many of you remember uh, this Apollo mission? It wasn't that long ago, and I'm sure you've seen reruns if nothing else. Weren't we uh, totally blown away with the marvel of the technology, the sophistication, and, and the breakthroughs that mankind had made? Well, guess what? The Apollo guidance computer had, uh, had a processor which was 2.0488 megahertz. That's the same uh, computing power as a musical greeting card today. <laughs> the Mars Curiosity rover, which we're also fascinated about, that has a 200 megahertz processor. It's about one-seventh, roughly, of the phones you carry in your pocket. This is how computing is advancing. Uh, it's, we know Moore's law, but Moore's law is really the fifth paradigm of exponential growth. It's one of many paradigms which has been um, happening for thousands of years. And right now, we're on this exponential curve. Let me explain to you what that means. This is what you get for $1,000. This is the way Kurzweil's chart. As of 2010, for $1,000, you get the computing power of a mouse brain. By 2023, for $1,000, in your pockets, you get the computing power of you. No kidding. That by 2023, which is what, seven years from now, you will have devices which have the same computing power as human beings. By 2050, for $1,000, you will get the computing power of all of humanity combined. If this doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will, because this is an almost certainty. There are debates about how long Moore's law will last, but even Intel says it'll last eight to 10 years now, which means that those devices become as powerful uh, intellectually as you are. Now, here's the difference between linear and exponential, that we're human beings, we think linearly. If I ask you how far 30 linear steps is, I'm sure all of you can take a good guess, and it's about 30 meters or so. If I ask you what 30 exponential steps is, we're a bunch of Indians over here who know, who know their calculus, but um, most people don't understand, comprehend what this means. A th a 30 exponential steps is a billion meters. In simple English, that's 26 times around the planet. Why do I tell you this? Because technology is advancing exponentially. It is not expanding linearly. And guess what? It's everything that computing touches. It's AI, robotics, networks, sensors, synthetic biology, genomics, digital medicine, and so on, and so on, and so on. This is how technology is advancing today. This is the exponential path we're on. And the impact of this is going to be amazing. First of all, what does your smartphone already do? Look at what you carry in your pockets. Not only do you have a telephone, you also have your Walkman, your, your typewriters, your cameras, encyclopedias, GPSs, and so on and so on. This is what you have in your smartphones. We don't seem to realize you know, the power we're carrying there. Let's look at the advances in sensors. You remember these old devices that we used to use? Start with the uh, digital camera. It came out in 1976. 1976, I think Scholle was playing. I'm sure you remember that. <laughs> what you have right now in your smartphones is a billion times better. Between Scholle and today, a billion times the improvement in the cameras in your, smart, in your pockets. Accelerometers and gy gyroscopes. The US military had these ICBM navigation units, which, which gave it a strategic advantage. They were America's key advantage. They used to weigh, you know, typically 50 pounds or so, and they cost millions of dollars. What you have in your pockets cost about a dollar. It's a billion times better. It's more accurate, more precise than those ICBM units that the U.S. government considered to be a strategic advantage. GPS. The first commercial GPS came out in 1981. It weighed 53 pounds, and it cost $120,000. You've got a little chip in your phone that is a GPS. And the apps that you have are more accurate, more precise, 
than anything that you could buy in 1981. You took your phone apart, and I don't recommend that you do this at home. You would find sensors and computers that would have uh, you know, cost hundreds of thousands of dollars and weighed literally hundreds of pounds just 30 or 40 years ago. This is what you're carrying in your pockets. Robotics. When I was young, I used to dream about Astro Boy. It was my favorite cartoon. I don't know if anyone watched him or not, but we all watched R2-D2. We watched uh, Rosie from the Jetsons. These are things we grew up dreaming about. And I know when I was young, I used to dream about having Rosie because I would get into trouble for not cleaning my room. So I imagine that uh, I would have Rosie cleaning up after me so mom won't yell at me. We never got Rosie. What do we get? Stupid Roomba. Uh, what happened over here? We had such big dreams. We thought that by the time we become adults, give or take a few years, we'll have all these robots serving us. The problem was that the computing power required for voice recognition and face recognition would have required a Cray supercomputer. The sensors for 3D vision motion were too big and too expensive until now. What you have in your pocket is many times more powerful than the Cray supercomputers that the US government would not allow to be exported to India. You remember export controls for computers, for supercomputers? How the Indians used to crave having a supercomputer so they could do weather forecasting? You can carry a supercomputer in your pockets when you uh, go across the border now, and no one even blinks an eyelid. This is how technology has advanced. What happens is that as technology advances, the footprint shrinks and the price drops exponentially. This is the era we're in right now. To start a technology company 15 years ago, you needed to have at least $3 million because you needed to have servers, you needed racks, you needed to have all of these uh, expensive facilities to manage your back-end operations. What do you need right now? A $400 laptop and that you can start a company. That's how simple it's become. Let's look at robotics. These are amazing robots. Um, the robots cost $20,000, $30,000, $40,000 right now. Robots that have the dexterity of human beings. As of, as of this year, actually, as of last year, it is cheaper to manufacture in the United States than in China. Watch the Chinese economy get into serious trouble over the next decade because a third of the eco economy disappears. Manufacturing, which, which you know, flooded to China, is already beginning to return. And what's a trickle will become a flood over the next five to seven years. You're going to see economic disruption like you never imagined before because of these advances. Uh, one of the reasons why Foxconn couldn't deliver on its promise to have a million robots in China was because the robots weren't dexterous enough. Last month, ABB announced Yumi, which cost $40,000 and can thread a needle. Google bought Boston Dynamics, which is delivering these humanoid robots and these uh, pet-like robots. You think it's a coincidence that uh, Google called their operating system Android? It has big plans. Watch and see what happens over the next decade. And who else is building robots? Well, you folks are sitting there surprised that uh, robots can be built right now. Children are building them. If you want to inspire your children, if you want to motivate them to get into science and technology, get them to be part of FIRST Robotics. This is Dean Kamen's um, um, his competition, where children in schools get together and build robots. It's amazing what they can do. And nothing inspires children to be into engineering and science more than, than building something. First Robotics is all over the nation and now expanding all over the world. It's an amazing uh, organization. Children are building robots. Don't be surprised if your child, if your niece, nephew or niece ends up building a rosy for them if you yell at them enough. This is what has become possible right now. They're becoming our companions. There's some children in the room, so I won't comment on that too much, but I know what the dirty old men in this room are thinking. Yes, that's going to be a multi-billion dollar uh, industry. Clerks, pharmacists, surgeons, we will not need human beings to uh, do the type of work that's done in warehouses, which is done in stores, which is done in McDonald's. Robots can do the same things that human beings can do now. This is not science fiction, this is happening already. Chauffeurs, Google announced last week that it's going to start testing its, uh, you know, it's a driverless car that doesn't have a steering wheel in the next few weeks in Mountain View. Within three years, 
we will have self-driving cars, 100% automatically self-driving cars available on test circuits. Within five years, they're going to be on our roads. Tesla already is releasing a, releasing a semi-automated version. I'm getting the, the Model X, which will drive itself on the highways. They're going to keep adding features for the next three or four years until the car drives itself. What becomes possible with self-driving cars is nothing more than mind-blowing. My prediction is that within 15 years, we will be having debates about whether human beings should be allowed to be on the highways or not. I'm not kidding. Human beings get drunk, they crash into each other, they get road rage, they all rush into traffic at the same time, they start yelling at their wives on the phone while they're driving. It's crazy what human beings do. Why should we allow these, uh, these imperfect creatures on the roads? So human beings will not be allowed to enjoy your cars while you can because they'll be self-driving before you know it. And then delivery vehicles. Now, the FAA has been going back and forth about drones. Finally, it's relented. It's going to let Amazon start testing them. One of the companies at Singularity University, where I'm on the faculty, is Matternet. They've already developed a drone-to-drone -a -drone delivery system. What it does is that it's like the internet. It goes from point to point to point to point. We're on the NASA base. By mistake, one of the drones crashed on Route 101. The police warned the, the, uh, the team that if they ever get caught doing it again, they're going to go to jail. NASA would not allow them to test on, uh, on the Ames Research Campus. So they said, screw it. They went to Honduras, tested their technology over there. And now the king of Bhutan has opened up Bhutan to them. They're actually testing their drone-to-drone -drone delivery system in Bhutan. Innovation has globalized, and amazing things are happening everywhere. Look at these robotic birds. That is a robot. Robotic kangaroo, butterflies. He is a robot as well. Einstein and Diego San are both robots that can recognize human emotion, and they're both about five-year-old technology. The latest iterations of these technologies has gone way, way beyond that. Tiny little spiders that are literally robots. This is the state of the art right now. And then printing. It used to be that when you had to do printing, we would worry about typesetting. Most of you remember what typesetting is. When's the last time you worried about typesetting? If you told your children, uh, you know, use the word typesetting, he or she wouldn't have a clue what you're talking about. It's like those rotary phones saying, what's typesetting? What do you do with this phone? What's happening now is that we simply go on our, our laptops, we slap together some graphics, hit the print key, and out it comes. We don't worry about complexity anymore. Imagine doing that in three dimensions. 3D printing is the next big thing. It's still slow to do 3D printing, but you can print plastic, glass, titanium, human cells, amazing things using 3D printers. This is a sped up, but this is, these are 3D printers in action. This is today's version of 3D printers, where you can literally print all sorts of new designs in this manner. The next generation, this is a Carbon 3D, which rolled out a Terminator-like 3D printer. Give it 5, 10, 15 years, and we will be printing most of our, our everyday goods on 3D printers. Give it about 20 years, and we'll be 3D printing our iPhones. This is a 3D printed car, believe it or not. That doesn't blow your mind. Look at these uh, houses, 3D printed. That office building over there was printed at the rate of one floor a day. That, that 12,000 square foot mansion was made of recycled steel and glass, 3D printed, at a cost of $161,000. China is where this happened, Shanghai. Chinese costs are lower than the United States, but not that much lower. Imagine now if we could start 3D printing our houses. In 3D printing, you're not constrained by design. You're not constrained to doing things the old-fashioned way. We can come up with structures that are much more meaningful, comfortable, aesthetic than what you can possibly conceive right now. This is five, ten years away. Or if you go to China today. And then let's look at medicine. I don't know if you realize that our smartphone has also become a medical device. We've seen the progression from those rotary phones to what um, uh, Gordon Gecko had in Wall Street. Remember that phone that he carried? Why do we remember that? Because the cell phone was the ultimate symbol of power about 15 or 20 years ago. He was rich. He was a filthy Wall Street. Where, where's Preet Bharara? I mean, uh, Preet's best friend. <laughs> Just kidding. Now, 
you know, the poorest of the poor have cell phones. In fact, calling from India to here is cheaper than calling from here to India. Anyone can afford to dial you anymore. Remember we used to go back to India? We'd have to book STD calls, ISD calls, trunk calls, all this other crap. We used to worry about long distance calls, have to book in advance. Literally, beggars in India have uh, smartphones now. Last time I was in New Delhi, my beggar's cell phone went off. Fortunately, he stopped begging to answer the call. <laughs> Your phone is also an encyclopedia of medical knowledge. Already, you can get almost any information you want. Five or ten years ago, if you got sick, you went to the doctor. If you didn't believe the doctor, you got a second opinion. What do you do now, right now? You go online and you Google it, and you have more information than your doctor does. When I was young, the Encyclopedia Britannica was not affordable by my middle-class parents. So I used to envy my friends who had Encyclopedia Britannica. There's an Encyclopedia Britannica app that you can download right now. It has only three stars. It's crap. No one even bothers to download it. It really is, is something worthless today because there's much better, more current knowledge available to all of us for free. I don't know if you realize that your phone is also a glucose meter. You can go by Walmart right now, and for $30, you can buy a glucose meter that connects to your iPhone. It's also a heart monitor. For $75, you can get a live cores EKG monitor. It's amazing what you can do with these phones now. A digital dermatologist, most of you don't have this problem, but if you're a white person, you get uh, hang out in the sun too long and you worry about getting skin cancer. Well, take a picture of it, upload it for $5, you'll know the answer. An autoscope. Ramesh Rusker from MIT is doing some amazing things. His goal is to produce an ophthalmologist that can be used by villagers in India for $20. This will be an add-on to the Android phones that they have. $20 is what his goal is. I'm Mitra. Wide variety of medical tests. Almost anything you can think of right now is going to be available on your smartphones. And your phone is also a medical researcher. That the, announcement, the big announcement that Apple made last year wasn't a bigger iPhone. Everyone was, ooh and ah, I have a six-inch iPhone. That wasn't the big deal. The big deal was that Apple announced health kit. It announced research kit. It, be, it entered the clinical trials business. It also announced the Apple Watch. And soon, we won't even need watches. We won't need these external cases. We will have tattooed sensors, and we'll be always on. All of our vital signs, all of the information of our bodies will be uploaded to the cloud via our smartphones. And then we'll have sensor devices to monitor our internals. I don't know if you people remember that movie, Fantastic Voyage, in which we shrunk the human beings, they were put in a capsule, and they went inside the body. Forget the shrunken human beings. I'm not predicting that. But the capsules to do this are already available, commercially available today. You can now go inside the body and start uh, photographing um, in high definition and uploading to the cloud. And what's more, telemedicine is growing at phenomenal rates. Soon, we will be able to have sensors in our homes which monitor us and see a doctor online. Right now, if you get sick, your child gets sick, you have to drive all the way across town and then wait in line, fill out stupid forms uh, to see a doctor, and you get even more sick because there are other, other sick people around you. So why not just simply go online and see the doctor immediately? This is possible today and will accelerate as we have better sensor-based devices. Medicine is becoming digital in, in IT and information technology. So you have sensor data, electronic medical records, telemedicine, and home health monitoring. Why do you think Google spent $3.2 billion buying uh, Nest? Do you think Google is stupid enough to spend $3.2 billion on buying um, a stupid thermostat? No, Google wanted to have a platform for home health data. That's what it makes possible, that you, know, you now have a central station on which you can start gathering all sorts of data and uploading to the cloud. The technology industry is planning to eat medicine. I say that literally. That the tech industry has now entered the field of healthcare, a $3 trillion industry. You will see advance after advance after advance over the next few years to the point that you now have a smartphone who's your doctor, who will monitor you 24-7 and advise you. If you eat that extra piece of Ras Malai, you will get an SMS saying, abort, abort, abort. You don't need it. You just had the rasgullas. <laughs> and then robotic surgery. 15 years from now, if I have an accident, I do not want a human being operating on me. 
Because the human beings will be as competent as those human drivers. They get distracted. The surgeon comes to work half drunk and then operates on you. Whereas robotic surgeons will be a lot more precise, a lot more accurate, and they will be able to do the job much better than any human being can do. This is already becoming possible. Intuitive Surgical, which is a Silicon Valley-based company, is already marketing a pretty sophisticated device. Watch it become autonomous and not require the human being. Brain-computer interfaces. Those devices are being operated by uh, people who don't have facilities to, uh, to operate devices themselves, in other words, through the brain. It won't be long before we have BCI interfaces, brain-computer interfaces, by which we can now operate machinery, and we start reading our thoughts in gentle ways. But that's nothing compared to the big revolution to come, genomics. The human genome was sequenced about 14, 15 years ago. It cost about $3 billion. Now a complete human genome sequence costs about $1,000. At the rate at which technology is advancing, sometime in 2020 or so, I'll come up here and show you my iPhone case in which, we'll, which, which you can do a complete human genome sequence. The price will be practically zero to do genomic sequencing. The significance of this is that we become software, that the bits and the bytes that make us up have been deciphered, decoded, and they can be programmed like IT systems can be programmed. We're heading into an era of genomic medicine where, tailor, where healthcare is tailored to the needs of the individual based on genomic information. This is by Eric Green, who heads up the US Genomics Project. He believes that within the 2020s, we're going to be in an era of genomic medicine, which means that you take your genetic profile, you take your microbiome, you take your medical history and lifestyle information, and medications are prescribed based on that not on the dumb factors of speaking to a physician and him pretending to look at notes that he took last time you were there and then prescribe the same stupid medications to you. It will be based on who we are, what we are, and how we behave. The 2020s we're talking about. And then printed organs, bionic enhancement. That beautiful lady over there is Amanda Boxtel, a friend of mine, who had a skiing accident about 20 years ago. Now she dreams of skiing again. She's already walking around on um, an exoskeleton made in, in Berkeley, California, by Exobionics. Steve Austin, the $6 million man, will be a reality by 2025, 2030, except Steve will not cost $6 million. He will cost $6,000. We're headed into an era of bionics, human enhancements. This is taking us into the Star Trek future, into what we dreamed about when we were young. I know that I used to dream about Captain Kirk's communicator, the tricorder, that medical device that could, could scan you and tell you how you were doing, replicators that you saw, universal translators where you go to any planet and, and, and everyone speaks English to you, virtual displays, holodecks, and, and so on. This is what we dreamed about. We didn't get them. Actually, we did get some of these things. Captain Kirk's communicator didn't play music, receive emails, surf the web. Did you ever see Kirk checking email on his uh, communicator? It didn't talk to him. Siri does talk to him. Siri takes photos. What we have today is better than what Captain Kirk had on Star Trek. The only difference is it doesn't talk across planets, but give it time and it will. We have, what we have is better than the Star Trek communicator. The 3D printers are version 0.1 of the replicators we saw on Star Trek. Wait till version 3.0, and it would look pretty much like what you saw on Star Trek. The tricorder, there's an X prize for $10 million in which the results will be announced in about two years or so. And there are several companies, including one in Silicon Valley called Scanadu, that are competing for it. I'm most impressed with a company that I'm watching in India, which has actually built a product called the Swastaya Slate that can do 33 medical tests. They've added another 100 medical tests to it. The device is inelegant and not ready for prime time yet, except it's being used on 2.5 million people in Jammu and Kashmir. Give it two or three years, and that will be more advanced than any medical tricorder built in the USA. It's on its way. Five years, and we will have iPhone-like devices that are the tricorders we saw in science fiction. If not five years, 10 years. It's not 50 years. It's not 15 years either. The tricorder is not that far away. Universal translator. Microsoft is already adding features to Skype by which you can do instant translation. Version 0.1 right now. Give it five years, give it 10 years, 
and we will be dynamically translating languages. Maybe we want to cling on a Romulan yet. We haven't found them yet. But almost every human language will be translatable in the next decade or so. Holodex. Well, remember Star Trek Princess Leia? This is uh, Star Wars. I mean, I'm actually confusing Star Wars and Star Trek, but it doesn't matter. I did a conference in Uruguay three years ago in which they beamed me on the stage. The technology has been here for years. Give it a little bit of time, and I won't need to come here physically. I'll be able to beam on stage inexpensively from my home. The holodeck is coming. We'll have virtual reality facilities in which we feel like we're already there. Virtual displays. Google Glass was um, uh, withdrawn a few, uh, you know, a few months ago. I won't be surprised if, if within the next week or two, Google doesn't release beta versions of Google Glass, Google Glass 2.0 which is going to be a much better device. Then wait till Google Glass 3.0 or 4.0 before you're completely blown away. That is, if Facebook doesn't deliver a new version of Oculus first, I saw a really neat demo outside of, of, um, of um, uh, virtual display, which was better than what I've seen from uh, Oculus. There are many, many companies building it. We won't need monitors the way we do. We won't need to watch movies on big screens anymore. We'll have virtual reality relays, uh, displays in our glasses, and later in our retinas, which take us into these experiences. Next five, 10 years, not 15 years, five or 10 years. Transporter. Beam me up, Scotty. No, thank you. I don't ever want my atoms being disintegrated, even though uh, scientists believe that quantum trans transportation is becoming possible. Quantum teleportation, by which your atoms are beamed from one place to another part of the galaxy within uh, milliseconds. It's becoming possible, but Again, this is not something I would ever want uh, to experiment with. Flying cars, we dreamed about flying cars, we never got them. Well, they're also coming. These are, uh, this is a, uh, a Czech-made uh, flying car, which actually works pretty well, not that far away. So a lot of good is happening. There's also a dark side to everything I talked about. I mean, um, I keep focusing in my talks about the bright side because I believe that we could have the Star Trek future in which we focus on the, in which it's not about the acquisition of wealth anymore. It's about uplifting humanity, about bettering mankind. Because the future we're headed into, all of our basic needs can and will be met by technology. The price of everything will drop. We'll be able to synthetically produce meat. We'll be able to 3D print our daily, daily needs. The cost of everything won't be based on the complexity of the object. It'll be per pound. You'll print your iPhones by pounds, essentially. This is the future we're rapidly headed into. It's amazing what we can make of it. But we could also have a Mad Max future in which we destroy ourselves, use technology for evil. This is why I keep encouraging entrepreneurs to solve real problems and to think big. Because what's become possible now is for entrepreneurs to solve the grand challenges, challenges of humanity, to do what only big research labs and big governments could do before in solving grand problems. We can solve the problems of, of energy, hunger, disease, all of these things can be solved. It used to be that it would require millions of dollars to start a technology company. Now it costs hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars. Really what you need is a place to live and some food to eat, and you can buy sensors to, to automate agriculture. You can buy sensors to now uh, build health monitors. You can take advantage of AI tools on the web to analyze data. The science fiction that we dreamed about has become possible right now, and any of the people in this room can do it. Entrepreneurs can now transform humanity like we dreamed about before. This is where we're headed. If we don't blow ourselves up in the meantime, and if we stay on track. And this is why, like I said, I, I give so many talks encouraging people to use technology for the good, because this future is happening. People don't believe it. People still think that, that just because we didn't have Rosie, we didn't have robots when we were young uh, to now, these things won't happen. They're wrong. We're on this exponential curve. We're at the curve right now where everything is happening at light speed. The next 10 years will be more amazing than the last 10 years. We will start solving the grand challenges of humanity. So use this technology for good is my message to all of you. Thank you.